Turkish defense exports have reached a record-breaking high as sales neared $6 billion in 2023. The past year also saw the country wrap up some of its most anticipated projects from its first aircraft carrier, TCG Anadolu, to its unmanned combat aerial vehicles, Baha, Anka 3 and TB3. The latest one to take flight was Anka 3, developed by Turkish Aerospace Industries. As for drone maker Baikar CB3, it is the updated version of TB2, which has been used in conflicts around the world, from Azerbaijan to Libya and more recently Ukraine. These developments are part of an ongoing transformation in the country's defense sector over the past two decades, during which it's faced a score of Western arms embargoes. For Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, investing in defense is a must for the nation as a way to eliminate internal and external threats, one being the PKK terrorist organization. Now, Turkey will allocate around $40 billion to its defense budget in 2024, while it expects to dominate the arms industry, especially in African countries. And for more on Turkey's defense industry's expansion in 2023, joining me now from Islamabad is Hamza Rifat. He is a political analyst. And from Ankara, Merve Seren Yeshiltaş. She is an associate professor at Yildirim Beyazıt University. A warm welcome to you both and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Merve, Turkey's defense industry has set a new record with $5.5 billion in 2023, remaining slightly below the earlier announced target of $6 billion. What does that tell us about the state and the shape of this industry? Well, actually, first of all, I think the most important thing is that now we are starting to see the concrete outputs of the, uh, the production phases of what ha Turkey has been spending on, investing on, especially uh, in the beginning of the early 2000s. So the thing is that when we are looking at what are the products, I think those products have been the journey of 20 years. So the thing is, this is very important to underline that we started to export the products, especially after the 2016, 2017, 18s. So just look at what the Tusaj, I mean, it is also the Baikar, as you know, it's placed as the first um, as it's exporting its drone system. But also when you look at Tusaj, I think it's very important, the Tai system, because it's not only exporting its drone system, but it's also exporting its helicopters, which are world-class proven systems, but as well as it's like training aircraft systems. So the thing is that I think what we have to see is that now it's not only the drones, but also there is a wide variety of the products we are selling to the world. And the most two important things that we have to underline, the first thing is that we are uh, good at the technological level. And the second two is that we are all combat proven systems. So we are proving them on our cases. And then now we are starting to the world. And, and another third thing maybe to mention is uh, also the countries that we are exporting now, it's also yes. they are increasing day by day. So uh, as just uh, Merve mentioned, uh, Hamza, Turkey exports more than 20, uh, 230 defense uh, industry products to about 180 countries, including drones, to NATO members, Arab countries in the Gulf and North Africa, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa and Indo-Pacific countries. So the question is, what is behind the increasing demand uh, for Turkey's um, defense products? Well, I think the best way to actually answer that question is to take a look at uh, Anka 3, uh, yes. which is the latest technology that actually came about. Uh, it looks at several different aspects of defense technology, which were previously unheard of. You're looking at reconnaissance. You're also looking at the ability to try and make sure that you can uh, come up with precise targets as well. And you're also looking at the ability to survey and conduct combat missions beyond Turkey's borders. Now, this is something that is completely new and novel to uh, global technological expertise, because it also enables countries to make sure that targets which are very difficult to identify and through radar systems, they can actually nab those targets and make sure that that can actually be taken care of. So I think that is the best uh, form of example that you can use to try and make sure that why are Turkey's defense products so highly in demand? And there's another uh, extremely important aspect about this is that, you know, when you talk, take a look at the target points through which uh, certain technologies can actually be implemented. Those target points are to ensure that there should be maximum capacity as far as precision targeting is concerned. Mm. So this enables uh, Turkey's defense products to make sure that they A, have more traction amongst NATO member countries, uh, have more traction amongst Eastern European countries, and also has a potential market in Asia as well, where there are also existential threats. I would also like to link this briefly to the PKK threat 
that has actually haunted Turkey for quite some time. I think this drone technology ensures that security challenges in the Middle East, uh, you know, chief of them from the PKK, can actually be addressed in an adequate manner. So, Marve, uh, as we just mentioned, Turkey's new stealth drone, Anka, has just undergone its uh, maiden flight. We're still waiting for Khan. So how significant is this? And as just uh, Hamza mentioned, I mean, how will they add to Turkey's defense capabilities? Well, there is a saying in the defense industry that if you have never ever produced a fighter aircraft, you have never produced an aircraft. So the thing is that I think the technological level, competency level, uh, is definitely identified with your capabilities in the fighter aircraft. And the thing is that Turkey is uh, aiming to produce the five plus you know, generation. And this is very important. So the thing is that when we were talking with you in our previous programs, we were always mentioning that Turkey's three principles uh, you know, has reshaped its defense industry. The first was is the localization, nationalization, and strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing is now Turkey is capable of producing locally and nationally its fifth generation air aircraft, fighter aircraft. And what just you are mentioning what's happening with the F-16 case and F-35 case. So whenever we have got like divergences of interest with other countries, even our NATO allies, they're always punishing us with the embargoes and sanctions. So the thing is that the level of self-defense capability is very important and always the aircraft superiority is the most important one of the power projection dimension in the battlefield that we have to keep in an eye and so the thing is that Khan, yes we are waiting for it to fly and uh, meet with the skies and so the most important thing is that look at the people the manpower of the uh, when they have taken in in the, in the early 2000s there were almost like 2700 people working but now it is six 16,000 people are working. So, uh, Hamza, most of the uh, GCC states uh, have defense industry cooperation agreements uh, recently with Ankara, and they're expected to reach uh, to a higher level. Uh, so we know that Western military equipment, especially American and European hardware, have been dominating the uh, Gulf defense market. Is this about the change with newcomers like Turkey, China and Russia? Well, definitely, because if you take a look at many of the characteristics uh, of Turkey's defense products, you would actually understand that, you know, they actually are more cutting edge than the traditional, uh, you know, technological products that have been produced by the United States and the United Kingdom, for that matter, and also from Russia and China. The reason is because you see the balance of power within the world order is actually shifting towards the east. And when we look at China's military industrial complex and obviously with Russia and Turkey with, you know, uh, drone technologies such as Anka 3 and obviously the Khan fighter jet also coming about, it would actually gain more traction amongst the GCC member countries, particularly in light of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where they actually want to make sure that they want to distance themselves from U.S. Uh, defense cooperation agreements. And there's no real incentive to do so. And with that in mind, there's a vacuum that Tur a country like Turkey can actually make sure that they can actually capitalize on to try and make sure that they can export to GCC countries. Because of the very fact that when we look at, you know, countries such as Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, you, know, you look at Oman, you also look at Qatar for that matter, they want to make sure that they can diversify their pool of defense imports to a large extent and not rely on a sole source from the West, mm -hmm. particularly in light of regional dynamics, which many Arab countries, especially in the GCC, actually blame the United States for actually engineering. I'm talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also the PKK conflict as well, which Turkey rightly blames on the United States for actually perpetuating. So another aspect, Marve, how is Turkey's flexibility in technology transfers making it a more reliable partner when compared to its uh, Western competitors? I mean, can we say, is Turkey pursuing the democratization of technology transfer? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I think there are so many advantages of Turkey when uh, as an exporter player in the market. The first thing is that there is a very good saying and another. Um, they say that if you sell a weapon, you buy a friend. So mm -hmm. the thing is that so many times the Americans, you know, collected all the friends all around the world, across the world. And what if they expected, it didn't behave the same friendship. So whenever you are buying something else from the United States, always you have, cut, you have to face with the challenge of the United States Congress. So whenever you have got a problem, Problem with the foreign policy every time they are using these weapons uh, as an instrument of deterrence, as an instrument of punishment. So the thing is that the, I think the friends of the United States is, I think, tired of being this friendship. So they wanted to increase the variety of their 
suppliers. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is that when we are looking at the European competitors, they are failing most of the time in the African countries about the logistics, about the um, part manufacturing, about the training system. So the thing is that what we have to keep in mind that when you sell a weapon, there is a product life cycle management. So Turkey is not only selling its technology, but it's also very good at this production life cycle management. It keeps on the sustainability of the logistics logistics, with the part manufacturing, with the training, we are not just only selling and we are leaving behind them, yes. those who are friends. So I think it's very important. And also Turkey is much more cheaper when you compare with the other competitors. Cost effective. So um, Hamza, Turkish defense products, as we've said, uh, reach also East and West African nations. So why have African countries become interested in buying Turkish arms? I mean, what kind of a policy does Turkey follow when it comes to the combination of security with economics? Well, I think there's one very, very important variable that most African countries actually take into consideration. And we're looking at most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, which are impoverished, which have security quagmires from Boko Haram to the Islamic State in, you know, the in Somalia, for that matter, and also Al-Shabaab. One of the reasons why they would actually want to make sure that they could go with Turkey as far as defense products is concerned is because most American technology comes with strings attached. Mm -hmm. They look at internal security quagmires from a very narrow lens, and it does not necessarily take into consideration the indigenous problems that many African countries actually consider. That's one of the reasons why many African countries such as Sierra Leone, as well as Senegal, have actually turned towards Russian and Chinese uh, you know, defense products. And Turkey is, uh, you asked me about the policy. Well, Turkey's policy is to ensure that economic development is actually spurred by combating internal threats. And Turkey can use its example of the PKK threat that actually uh, yes. faces, which is a transnational threat, with African countries as well. Because when we take a look at Al-Shabaab, it does not necessarily operate in Somalia only. And they also have links with Boko Haram as well. So these terrorist groups have a huge impact on uh, you know, oil-rich economies such as Nigeria, as well as countries which have actually an immense amount of economic potential as far as their resource potential is concerned. But they're still not able to deal with those quagmires despite having a legacy of importing American defense products. That's where Turkey's uh, defense products, which are aimed at combating internal and external threats, through a discipline and, mature, uh, and ensuring that economic prosperity actually materializes, that is why African nations would be more inclined towards purchasing Turkish, yes. Chinese, as well as Russian defense products. All right, Hamza and Merve, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.